being locked, and I want to be Houston's next mayor. Let me tell you something about myself first. Father of five children. That's probably all I need to say. <laughs> By that very statement, you know that I've been able to negotiate a household. You're running the city. It's something like negotiating a household in terms of keeping competing interests, working together, moving down the same course. In this city, our greatest asset, just like in my family, my greatest asset, my children. In this great city, greatest asset we have for our people. We are a diverse population. Sometimes we come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different incomes. You've got to have a mayor who's able to get us all working together. Common playbook, common plays, working together. I think I can do that, and so I assert to you that I believe that there are three things that you would want to have in your next mayor. Experience, vision, and leadership. I think my experience speaks for itself, and I'm very pleased. Not only have I been city attorney, not only have I represented most of the governmental entities in this city, I know government back and forth, but in a prior life, I ran Congressman Lee's Washington, D.C. office. I've been a businessman, run my own law practice for a number of years, and in a life prior to the prior life, I was an everyday person who did things that everyday people work. I was a steel worker and I worked in an oil refinery. Been a member of a trade union. I have had the experiences that Houstonians have had. And so that experience collectively, I think, prepares me for this tough task of being there. Vision. Where will this city go? Great international city, known throughout the world, but a city that is a safe city, a city that is economically prosperous and a city that provides a great quality of life for its people. Great neighborhoods, great parks, great schools, great transportation system. And so that's the vision, leadership. Fortunately for me, I've been able to work with a lot of people in a lot of contexts. And because of that, I have a unique ability to bring people together to move forward. That's why I use the analogy early on with the family. And so in this election, I'm the candidate who's been endorsed by labor, who's been endorsed by business, who has support on the east side of town, on the west side of town, north side of town, south side of town. Every ethnic group I have supporters, people of all different races, faiths, and incomes. And I think it's indicative of a belief that I can pull the city together. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to discuss my beliefs with you today. Thank you very much. Um, the first question I have for you is when we talked about diversity, and one of the things that's been happening around the country with large populations is uh, conflict because of resources with black and brown communities. Houston, I don't know how deep the problem is from your perspective, but how do you balance that out when you have an emerging uh, group of people that are now a majority? And, and already established in terms of how people see leadership. How do you reconcile the type of um, well, tensions that exist? I don't, I don't start with the premise that there needs to be tension. There can be black-brown unity if we work at it. If we don't work at it, we can have black-brown tension. And so I think the, 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 the task of leadership is to work in that regard, to make sure that both communities understand the mayor is looking out for both of their interests, and to make sure that there is inclusion from both communities in decision-making processes, and making sure that there's collaborative discussions about the individual needs of each community, and at least knows and understands the other. If we don't do that, we're going to perish together rather than advancing together. Are there unique interests in those respective communities that you as mayor know that you specifically have to sit down and get an assurance from those communities? Sure, there, there are some unique problems with every community. For example, in the African American community, if you look at uh, sexually transmitted diseases, it's the HIV. If you look in the Hispanic community, it's syphilis and gonorrhea. Now that doesn't mean that we can't have a program that addresses both of them, quite the contrary. On the health issue, we, send, we African Americans tend to suffer more from hypertension Attention. Diabetes can be a problem in both communities. So you've got a fashion programs that are unique. They're, the differences, in my view, are not things that can't be overcome. You have to be aware of them and work to overcome them. And my last question is, 
uh, you talked about young people, but oftentimes when we hear the word young people, we're thinking people high school le level and all that. For the work that we've done, we found that a lot of people between, say, 18 and maybe even 30 hadn't voted before until Obama came along, aren't very politically astute. How do you engage that particular demographic of people that is very big and useful? Well, I think we're trying in every way to reach them at levels that, that they're reachable, whether it's social media, uh, networking and media, whether it's having their friends and peers reach it to them, whether it's going where they are trying to talk to them. We certainly start at the college campuses because that's the field ground, but there are a lot of people who are neither on college grounds nor in the church house, and you got to go where they are and try to energize them. Any last things that you want to say to voters? No, I just think, you know, I want people on November the 3rd to remember the name Gene Locke. Thank you so much. Thank you.